All right, what's up everybody? Live and I think I'm through the phone. Yes, all right. Hello everybody, what's up? I haven't gone live in a while. Really miss you guys. So I'm a couple of minutes late. I was frantically trying to eat my food, um, which I haven't finished. And so I was making sure that I didn't have food in my teeth because nothing's worse. All right, what up people? Welcome. Today I have the amazing Monica Berg. She's my homie. She was on Women of Impact. I met her, God, I can't remember how long ago. Um, but she was the author of Fear Is Not An Option, which come on now, is that not like the best freaking title of any book ever? Um, all right, so I'm gonna do a little intro to her and then she's gonna come join and we're gonna answer any questions you guys have on anything and everything. So get your questions ready, drop them in the bottom for a sticker. Uh, I like doing sticker questions. All right, so there's my little context. Um, all right, so today we are joined by Fear Is Not An Option and COO, CCO, excuse me, of the Kabbalah Center, Monica Berg. Unapologetically fearless, this self-professed change junkie knows only too well what it takes to create the life you want. And now with her new book, Rethink Love, Three Steps to Being the One, Attracting the One and Becoming the One, Monica shares what it takes to create the love you want. Um, so guys, please help me and welcome the amazing, the fearless woman, my homie, Monica Berg. I'm going to go join her. The funny thing is, I forgot that she wasn't actually joined yet. What up, Monica? Um, I'm so excited. I haven't done a live in a while. So I'm super excited to... What up? Hello! Hi. How's it going, honey? Good. Can you see me? I can see you. Yeah. Can you see yourself? So I'm putting, um, I'm asking people to put, to submit some questions and I'm going to put them just under your neck right there. So if you want to maybe put the camera, can you put it slightly further back? Yeah. Uh, there it is. All right. Awesome. How are you doing? It's been ages. I'm doing well. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Last time I saw you, I believe was at one of our Women of Impact dinners um i think that was the last time i saw you and you just gave me this amazing t-shirt and so um it's so, it's so awesome to see you again hon so thank you for joining me you too i always love talking with you your energy is uh contagious oh thank you girl <laughs> um well i figured uh, we don't want to contract the covid so we may as well be contagious in another way right <laughs> i know i'm thinking that word can't be used so much anymore i know it's weird right um all right so we've got um a bunch of questions that have come in that we're going to ask you but I actually want to ask you my first question um, and I'm going to see if we've got it at the bottom. All right, here we go. So I'm going to remove that and I'm going to add another question right here. So this actually is from me based... Oh no, where did you go? Oh no, I lost Monica. I lost the woman. Where did she go? All right, guys, bear with me um, until she joins. I don't know what happened, um, but I'm going to talk to her about the 10, 10, 10 rule. Um, we did an interview together and she was breaking down the 10, 10 rule. And this is all about how to, um, right, here she is. No, one second, guys. Sorry, bear with me. All right, we're adding her again. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Apologies. Um, all right, hey. Yay. Hey. I have no <laughs> idea what happened. I don't know. It's It's been a week like that for me, I have to say. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to turn things around, girl. So um, when you were on my show, Women of Impact, there was one thing that you said that was unanimously the most earth-shattering thing for everybody that they freaking loved. And I want to talk to you about it a little. Guys, if you are just joining us, drop in the questions below. We're going to be answering them live. But my first question to you, Monica, you had explained the 10-10-10 rule. Um, can you break that down? Because it was so freaking powerful. I think that that can be extremely useful for people. Actually, before you answer, if you can see your head, if you can put the camera slightly lower so we can get more of your face there you go awesome good amazing okay. thank you so if you can break down the 10 10 10 rule for everybody um it was life-changing yes i i use it all the time and when i came across this gem um it's such an easy way to be able to predict your reactions and therefore make better choices about everything because you can tap into what you're feeling so when you find yourself in a situation where you don't know what to do you ask yourself, and this was actually coined by um, a woman named Susan Osmond, and she tried this. So I'll give you her story because I think it's a really powerful explanation. But basically, when you have a decision to make and you don't know what to do, you ask yourself, what would you do in 10 minutes, in 10 months, 
and in 10 years, right? So the example she gave, she was up for a promotion and that weekend there was a big event and everybody was gonna be there, all the, the big wigs, her boss, and basically this would be the weekend where she would get the promotion. She would go and she'd be there and she'd win him over. Um, it was also the weekend where her son was gonna get his black belt in karate. So what do you do? She's worked so hard her whole life for this promotion, right? But this is her son, it's a big day for him. So she asked herself this question. So in 10 minutes, um, both decisions you know, weren't great. They'd both be mad at her, they'd be disappointed, they wouldn't like the decision. Either way, she lost. In 10 months, if she decided to go for, on the trip, she would have gotten the promotion, but she would have disappointed her son, and she would have tried to make up with it either way for each of them, right? spoiling her son or kissing up to her boss, anything to win him over. But in 10 years, this is what she knew. And she realized it because she decided to go to the championship to watch her son get his black belt. And when he accepted the award and he got the black belt, the, the tears down his face, you know, that moment is nothing. There's nothing she could do later in life to get that back, right? Eventually she would have gotten the promotion anyway. And that weekend didn't really make or break anything. But seeing where her son, missing out on that experience 10 years later, there's nothing she could go back and do. So it's a really great way to anticipate how your choices are going to make you feel down the line. I think very often we tend to be very reactive about our decisions, right? Like, I feel this. I need to decide that. That's making me uncomfortable. I want to change that immediately. And we don't always give ourselves the perspective that we so need. God, it's so true. And I think that going to what you were saying about emotions, um, I absolutely used to think that my emotions meant they were reality. And so it, I would let my emotions guide me. But now I'm just like, emotions are like how I like to think of it in my own language. Emotions to me are like alcohol. It's like, it's going to sway me in a direction that may not actually be good for me. So what I like to do is I call it be emotionally sober when I make these decisions and giving that framework of the 10, 10, 10 then allows me to go, okay, I know that I've I can't make decisions based on emotion, so I need to wait. And then it gives me a structure to really break down because I think the worst thing, not even the worst thing, but the battle that I think most of us have is the momentary happiness versus the long-term happiness. And so I think a lot of us make decisions based on those momentary happinesses. And then down the line, we may regret it. So going to this woman, it's like she looks at the situation. It's like, okay, right now, maybe my son's going to accept or acknowledge, you know, like be okay with me not being there, but my boss might not. Okay, so in the right now, in this very moment, I'm gonna do what emotionally feels good. And that's maybe going to the job because my son will understand. But like you said, if you do the 10-10 in 10 years, are you gonna be glad that you made that decision or are you gonna regret it? So, And by the way, many people have used this to decide if they should get divorced or if they should stay in the marriage. Aww. I mean, it can be used for little things and for big things. And eventually when you practice this a lot, you really start to get to know yourself and really develop a great friendship with yourself because you start to make better choices. You know how you're going to feel in 10 years from now. Um, and I just wanna add, mm -hmm. I mean, I love talking about emotions. My husband and I gave a talk last night about this. And what I like to do with emotions, I like to use them for data because so many people become their emotion, right? If people respond in a way they're angry or they're sad, suddenly now they label themselves as an angry person or a sad person. But actually, emotions are just giving us information that we really need about ourselves, right? So if you approach it as a scientist and you're curious about your emotions, you can discover something deeper that you need to maybe change or grow. So for instance, if you're feeling unhappy, maybe it's an indication that you're on the, right, the wrong path. There's things that you might need to change in the way that you're living. If you feel happy consistently, and of course, there are times that we're up and down, but if you're feeling happy, that would show you that you're on the right track, you know? I think very often, though, people um, mistakenly stay stuck in the negative emotions and they don't actually use them to say, okay, this is a great motivator for me to change something in my life that's not working. Yeah, so true. And as you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, there is something to familiarity is being comfortable, even when that the familiarity isn't comfortable comfortable if that makes yes. sense so yes. it's like there's, there's comfort in the knowing even if the knowing is pain um and so sometimes it's in the unknowing that becomes so feel fearful that allow that doesn't allow you to actually try anything so i think that we can come we we find the comfort in the knowing even if it's not good for us exactly 
Exactly. So, all right. So, guys, if you are just joining, we're answering questions live. Drop them in the questions. Also, let us know where you're joining from. I love to hear um, how worldwide our audience is. So, drop us, let us know where you're joining from. And also, um, if you want, um, we do love these stickers at the bottom. As you can see, we have run right now for the questions. So, drop them in. All right, Monica, we're going to get to the another question. Um, let's have a look here. Also, I want to talk about your new book, which is so exciting. Um, let's see if we've got any. Um, all right. Oh, here we go. This is a good one. All right. So how do we interpret emotions? I like this question, too. Um, what I write about in my book is that we all have a go to emotion. And that is how we deal with trauma or things that have happened to us. So my emotion, my designated emotion is sadness. And I discovered this um, after I started observing, you know, I'd be happy and then suddenly sadness would kind of come over me. And I'm not a sad person. I'm not a depressed person. So I'd wonder, you know, what just happened? What triggered that? Because that was what I realized. That's where I would go when something happened. So when um, my, for instance, my uncle became schizophrenic when I was seven, seemingly overnight, I felt very sad about it naturally, but I also felt very isolated. When my father lost all of his wealth, um, again, the sadness came over me. When I had anorexia, the sadness. So what I learned to realize actually in interpreting my emotions is that when I started to feel like I was not in control of a situation, I felt hopeless, I would become sad. And once I understood that, then I could transform the sadness into something else. So instead, whenever I do get sad, I say, wait a second, what is it I feel like I can't actually control in my life or influence in my life? Because we always can. We always have choice. We have free will. That's our strength. That's our power. So I pause and say, okay, instead of seeing it this way, what are the opportunities? What are my options? And just like that, that emotion is gone. It was just there to show me something that that I felt wasn't working for me, that I felt hopeless in. Can you break that down a little more? Because that's so powerful. I'm so curious to know how you actually did it. So you identified that you, it was sadness was your go-to emotion. And I actually loved when you said that. As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, mine's anger. Like, it never really occurred to me, but 100% mine's anger. Um, so, okay, so you have identified for you it's sadness. Let's say I've identified for me it's anger. And then you said you broke it down to overcome it. What did you actually do? Like, what does that look like? Is it step one, know when you do it and then break that pattern? Um, like so it's interesting. I have, um, for my, in my book, Rethink Love, and I have a webinar. And in this course that I do, I have everybody take a name tag and they write their designated emotion on it, right? So you say, you know, Monica Sadness Berg. You would say Lisa, anger, like, right. So that becomes your name. And if you think about it that way, do you really want to wear your emotion? Is that mm -hmm. how you want to be viewed? Is that how you want your expression in the world to be seen? Certainly not. Then you stop and say, okay, that's not who I am. What is it that I feel? Because again, why do people get anger? They feel like nobody's hearing them and they feel like they don't have any options and they can't be heard or seen or get their way. So they're just going to yell the loudest until they shut people down and they have now been heard. It's the same. It's just another form of sadness, actually. It's just external versus internal. I was literally about to, I was like, do I stop her and tell her? I actually think growing up, I was taught not to cry in public. So my mom and dad divorced. I would walk into a room and my mom would always wipe her tears and pretend she wasn't crying. And so from there, I've, and I've definitely analyzed this. And so I've realized, okay, crying, um, you shouldn't show people that you cry. Okay, why? Is it maybe the weakness? You have to be strong for people. So I have over time, and I've looked into my adulthood, I've translated instead of crying and breaking, I put up my walls and anger is that, that barrier that stops me from crumbling and breaking. Exactly. So that is your designated emotion. You see, right. you somewhere along the line in your psyche as a child decided that was an acceptable way for you to express mm. yourself, right? In sadness, when I felt nobody else could hear me and nobody could comfort me, and again, it started with my uncle because nobody explained anything. I was like terrified. He was acting crazy suddenly, right? And everybody was also frightened. So I was like, okay, what's going to comfort me? My sadness, right? I don't want to be that person. When I realized fully that that emotion was, again, something that was making me small and limiting me, then I stopped and said, okay, what is the opposite of sadness? So a person who sees opportunities and struggles, who sees opportunities in the most difficult of challenges, 
is then happy, right? You're able to now say, okay, I have options here. Where am I going to find the gift in the struggle? So I just flipped it. So you would flip. So the anger, when you're feeling anger, you stop and say, okay, I know that I have far more effective tools of communication in my belt now. I am no longer the young Lisa who decided that this was the way I needed to communicate to be heard. And now I have other options. You always have options. If you don't think you do, of course, you won't see them. But it's, it's really a flip of a switch, right? You just make a decision in your mind. And it can be that simple. Dude, that was so freaking strong. I don't know about everyone else. I wanted to heart this video as you said that. Um, that was so strong. People that don't see options. Oh, God, I wish I could um, re repeat it verbatim. But, oh, my God, that was so strong. That was amazing. Because um, like I explained, when I – sadness actually did comfort me, right? Mm -hmm. It felt – like you said earlier, and I say that all the time, we live in a life of comfortable discomfort, right? It's better the devil you know than the one you don't, right? I, I, I don't – it's a, it's a self in, it's a self imposed prison, you know, but you still have bars on, but you can, the, the breeze comes in, you can look out, it's in the comfort of what you've built, but to really live a life of true happiness, fulfillment, joy, curiosity, where you have desire and you're hungry every day to discover something new, you need to shatter those walls, even if it's scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. And know that you have the option to do that. Cause that's what I think what you were getting to before is just like, if you don't think you've got an option, then you're not going to make any change. But you have to believe that you have the, the chance to change in order to actually make that change because otherwise you're just going to stay still. You know, it's so interesting. I was speaking to a friend of mine. Um, we did an, a live Instagram last week. His name's Bernard Whitman. He's really smart and he studies a lot of businesses and um, he works in politics and he sees like he takes percentages. He, he basically interviews people in the world and sees where they're at. So right now with COVID-19, he's doing that. And what I thought was really interesting is that he sees that right now people are very optimistic about positive change, right? A big rethink moment for the world. And people had settled for things and now they're just not willing to. So they're really starting to look at some flaws and systems and all kinds of things. But so it was like 80% were optimistic about change, but they were also equally pessimistic about change being able to occur. And I was thinking about it. And I think mm. that it's really hard to imagine change out there in the world when we don't think that we can actually change within our home or change mm. within our lives, right? So many people feel like they can't actually create the change that they want, which is a farce. And I understand that the first step really is to identify what is not working in your life and stop doing it. I don't even like, sometimes people approach life like, I need to find the big thing, I need to discover. No, just stop doing what's not working. Yeah, I'm such a, um, a believer in your mindset is going to get you where you want to go. So it's like, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, if it's big, if it's audacious, and you believe that it's possible, then trust me, the chances of you being able to get there are going to be way higher than the person that's sitting there saying something isn't possible. Um, so I think it all starts with if you believe that change is possible and then if you're open to how that change can come about because that's also another thing is that there's going to be so many different ideas and theories and you know from the world or as an individual even what we're talking about right if like being aware understanding and then saying do I want to change am I willing to change and am I willing to do the hard work to do that because let me any change is going to be difficult right it's like even going to the gym it's I think that people fear the pain right but we all know when it comes to physicality that if you go to the gym you want to feel the pain in order to grow but we don't give ourselves that same um luxury i think when it comes to the mind so yeah i often say you just have to decide to be really strict with yourself we're strict about other things right many people are strict about what they eat and they're strict about where they'll sleep and they're strict about really specific about so many things but when it comes to changing things internally that aren't working for you i think people don't but i really think it's about the fact that they they don't believe that they're worthy. They, they don't believe in themselves enough to think that they can really affect positive change in the areas that they deeply want to. Yeah, so true. Um, all right, we've got so many questions coming in. So let's get to the next one. I want to do a few shout outs. So we've got people from Denmark, Morocco, Croatia, Sweden, North Carolina, Ireland, California and Montenegro in the house. Wow. Welcome, everybody. That's so amazing. Um, okay, we just got a bunch of questions. So, guys, if you're just joining us, let us put. All right, let's have some. Um, oh, this is this is interesting. All right, what is fear telling us? 
That's a big question. Oh, um, it's from the same lady as well. Nina, Nina, you managed to get two questions on there. <laughs> um, so fear can tell us a lot of things. I think you need to identify which fear it is. In my book, I talk about three different types of fear. There's healthy fear, there's real fear, and there's logical fear. And we've discussed this together. Um, so healthy fear, I'll just go through it really quickly. Healthy is when it's set up for your survival and protection. It's a fear that you actually need because it helps protect you from harm. So if you're hiking and you're too close to the ledge, something in your stomach or it pulls you back, right? It doesn't, you get scared. Or if your hand's too close to a flame, you grab your hand back. It's also intuition. It's that gut feeling where you just feel like something's wrong. So that, in that case, fear is telling you, you know, you need to watch out, be aware. Real fear is set up in reality. It's based on things that actually happen, like death, sickness, um, rejection. But even with this, this type of fear can be a motivator for you to change. I'm all about transformation, I'm all about movement and growth. So I see a lot of people ruminating about losing their loved ones, losing their parents, their children, and they stay with these negative thoughts and they feed those. They give so much energy to that. I think that's a waste of time. So when those kinds of feelings come up, then make sure that you're living your best life. If you're worried about getting sick, for instance, then make sure that you exercise, that you eat healthy, that you don't abuse alcohol or drugs or whatever. So to live a life that actually will support health. If you're afraid of losing your parents, well, at least then the time that you spend together, make sure you're enjoying your time together. You tell them that you love them, you appreciate them, and you act accordingly. So even that kind of fear is giving us some great information about how to live our best life. And then there's a logical fear. And I think that people, and that's why sometimes I have people write down their fears, and then I have them mark next to them which one's real, healthy, and illogical. And most of the time they get it wrong because they're mostly illogical. That's where we spend most of our time is stuck with those kinds of fears, which is fear of heights and spiders and terrorists and like the things that don't happen on a daily basis, but that's like, that's what consumes us. So with that fear, I say go full on and eradicate it, right? Because if not, then you go through life and you collect new fears and more fears and you wear them and they are heavy and you're like, how did I become this fear-based person? So for instance, um, I'll give you an example. I went um, skiing and I'm a, I'm a good enough skier, but I don't ski often enough to be able to like excel ever. So every time I start again, I have to get a, a teacher and we, we go up and by the third day, I'm on a higher mountain and I'm feeling pretty good, but I'm never like comfortable. So the last day I went, um, we went on this like, he didn't really tell me by the way, but it was very steep, okay? And I like was barely making it, I fell, I made it down to the bottom and then he was like, okay, it was really nice meeting because like the end of the third day. And I was like, no, let's, we're going to go do it again. And he's like, really? So we did it. And I didn't fall that time. I wasn't comfortable by the way, but I did it. And he said to me after, you know, I do this all the time. Nobody has ever asked me to go back again after they try that. And he's like, why did you do it? I said, because if not, I would have left with a new fear today. And that would have been fear of skiing, right? So you want to challenge those fears because they're not real and they're set up to actually paralyze you to keep you stuck, to not have you live your potential or your dreams because you take this fear so, and it feels really real, by the way. Your heart will raise, your palms will sweat. It's going to feel authentically like this is a genuinely real healthy fear, but it's not. Yeah, and it, I love that you broke those down because I think that as humans, we automatically kind of put them all together in one bucket. And so you can't decipher between the fear of spiders and the fear of failing or the fear of failing versus, you know, jumping out of a plane. Like the, the, the fears all feel like one and the same. So I love that you broke them down like that. And I think that we even spoke about potentially having people like right now, write down all the fears you have and then put them into buckets. I think that'd be super helpful to then see which ones you really should be afraid of and are there for like your your health and ones that you are just afraid of based on other things whether it's childhood or an experience or something like that but I don't feel like you should ever really be afraid of anything because for instance I would love for everybody joining us today to really make this list write all your fears down yes. and then if for instance fear of um, sickness comes up there stop being afraid of it like take all of that negative energy mm. that you are putting focusing on 
the lack and the doubt and the uncertainty of life and the unknowable of life. That's, I mean, life is unknown. That's a fact, right? So why would you spend time worrying about something that you can't control? What can you control in that space? You can make sure that you live your best life. And by the way, you're going to be happier if you eat healthy. You're just going to feel better. Your mood will be better. So if you're going to get clear. I'm just saying there's, there's very little that you have to fear in life. Very, very little. And the ones that you can eradicate, yes, there's some work to do there. That's the illogical bu bucket. So do that. But the other ones, don't even spend another minute with it. Just do, do the exact opposite when that fear comes up. I love that. I actually had a guest on called uh, Michelle Polar. I don't know if you know her, but she did 100 Days of Fears. And she mm -hmm. literally spent 100 days in a row where she just tackled every fear that she possibly had. And her videos went viral. You know, so I had her on the show. And in my research phase, I started to look and research into fear itself because I like to you know, understand the context as well. And I'd come across this study um, where there's about 400 people in the entire history on record to ever have a um, brain condition where actually they cannot feel fear at all. Um, I can't remember the name of the condition, but what happens is it, um, your amygdala is, is completely calcified. So there's no fear whatsoever. And so it's only been about 400 people in the whole of the history of ever being recorded. And there's this one woman where they interview her. I don't know if you've heard this, it's fascinating. This, so they interview this one woman who has no fear. And so they're asking her, what does it feel like? And she's like, the only fear I can ever remember was like when she was four or something. And she's She's like, since then, I just don't understand. And I'm like, well, how do you get on with life? And she's like, but I don't know any different. This woman has been held at gunpoint twice. She's been held at knife point once because she doesn't understand the, the, the gut feeling where we all have that intuition, where it's like, hmm, there's something not right here. She doesn't get that. So she knows intuitively, or not intuitively, she knows when people say, don't walk down the dark alley. But she doesn't have that fear that stops her from really not walking down that dark alley. And there's this whole freaking story. So I hope I'm not boring you, but I found this so fascinating. No, I love science. I, everything that I talk about that's spiritual, I always back it up with science. It's fascinating. There, it reminds me of another study um, about people who didn't have access to their emotions, something with their brain. Yeah. And you would think that they were able to make better decisions because they were just coming from the logical, rational part of the brain, not the emotional. But without the emotional part, they didn't actually know how to make a decision because there was nothing that said, okay, remember when that happened and that felt that way? So they actually were really stuck. They felt very, very paralyzed in their life. And it's so interesting because we don't fully appreciate how complex and nuanced we are as human beings and how we need every part of us, our emotions, our fear to help us make the best choices, but instead we get stuck in the feeling of it, right? And, and, and how that, that, that's too scary or that's too this. It's so, it's, I find it fascinating. Yeah, and so actually, maybe you're talking also about the people that have those, they don't have a subconscious. So it's like, you know how we all have the thought in our head? There are actually people that don't have that, that the second something comes, they speak it. So they don't have any processing mechanism, which is insane. But going back to this woman, I want to tell you the story because I found it so freaking fascinating. So they, they, she gets interviewed and the psychologist interviews her and then she tells the story about when she was under knife point. She has a kid with her. She's walking in like, I think it's like the park at dark or something and so a guy grabs her sticks a knife in her neck and was like freaking give me your money but because she doesn't have fear she basically turns around to the, the guy and she's like well you can kill me but when i'm dead i'm gonna come and haunt you in your dreams so <sighs> and she because she didn't have the fear the the robber literally ran off he didn't he didn't do anything he just got so freaked out that she was so nonchalant that he literally just ran wow off. so the psychologist goes through and the thing that hit me so powerfully i'm going to say this close to the camera because this hit me so hard it's like is it true that without trauma nothing becomes traumatizing so mm -hmm. she didn't feel the trauma of that situation because she didn't have the fear so without the trauma, it, that situation didn't become traumatizing, so it didn't stick with her. Like, that's so freaking fascinating. But then the psychologist just goes, and going back, this is coming full circle, back to your point about this fears that are actually useful. And yeah. that's what he was saying is like, look, in certain situations, is she better off not fearing the fear? Like failure, right? Yes, she doesn't fear it. She can keep trying, falling on her face and not care if she gets embarrassed the next day. But 
the reality of a fear if there's someone with a knife or if you don't lock your doors at night like that's that's a real fear that is there to serve you and to protect you and so, how does she ever learn where where, where right. what comes up and said so, oh, remember that time and it made you feel this way and you're really scared let's not do that again <laughs> yeah exactly right there's no lesson learned because the, going back to the trauma so there's something in that that was like wow we look at trauma as being such a negative thing but is it like is trauma actually there sometimes i'm not saying always but is it there sometimes to teach us a lesson but see this is back to, like i love this conversation you need all of it we need all of this feedback that we get emotionally however what we do with it is entirely up to us right so even people who have been traumatized you can choose to learn from that experience and derive some kind of purpose and meaning, even from the most painful things, and then grow from them, right? So the emotions we feel, they are very necessary. We just far too often stay stuck in them for too long, and, and they become part of who we are, and that never feels good. Yeah, exactly, 100%. All right, we could d just do a whole um, IG Live just based on that alone. Um, but we've got so many questions. So guys, if you are joining us, we're answering questions live. So drop them in the stickers or just throw them in the comments. All right, let's get to another one. Um, oh, this is super interesting. All right. How do we forgive our parents for not teaching us how to manage our emotions? Wow. Well, this is interesting. Um, I think that, and I really like this question too. I think that when it comes to our parents, a lot of us hold this belief that they were supposed to uh, show us the right way and teach mm -hmm. us the right things. And I think, and this is the honest truth, it's not a comfortable one, but I think very often our parents show us what not to do or not to be. So even if your parents spoke to you in a negative way, right? And now that has become your belief system you at this stage of your life are responsible for the quality of your life. So the choice and, and the amazing choice that you get to have is to challenge those negative belief systems and create new ones from the adult space that you're in. I often talk about my father who has Alzheimer's and, and he's a constant reminder for me of how much to appreciate being able to have a choice to direct your life in the way that you want to spend your time in the way that you want, to be able to think critically and be able to challenge thoughts and beliefs that don't work for you because he doesn't get that option anymore in the state that he's in, right? So I think that far too often we take all of these things for granted and it's so important to really look back from where we came from. Nobody's perfect. Parents do the best they can. Sometimes they weren't giving the tools to be able to properly even parent, right? So I would go back and look and rewind and say, okay, where are they coming from? What tools did they have or didn't have? And now what options do I have? I remember years ago, I, I took all of my, I had all these VHS videos. My mom was always videotaping us when we were little, which we hated, of course, like get out of the camera, right. come be with yeah. us, you know? <laughs> and then of course, when you're older, your perspective is like, wow, I'm so happy you did that. Right? Yeah. So they were all starting to deteriorate. The film was getting very thin. And so I had them all converted to um, CDs. And we love London. We go back and forth a lot. And it was, um, and we spent the summer there. And so it was my birthday. And my husband went to the countryside because we have a friend who has the same birthday. I was like, go, you know, do a guy's thing. It's fine. And I had unbearable jet lag. And that day, for whatever reason, I did not ask them to send it to me. All the DVDs arrived to me in London, okay, on my birthday. Whoa. So my kids were younger then, and I was like wide awake. I'm like, I'll just put one in and watch it. I watched all 21 CDs that night, and I was a basket case because what I understood so fully and completely that washed over me in that night was that I finally saw my childhood through the lens of my parents, which is not a perspective you actually get, right? So I remember one specific Mother's Day where I remember feeling like my mom was not present. And so I was feeling sad, right? That was that emotion that came. 
And this time I saw that she was struggling. We had just moved there from the South. She was trying to fit in with her own family dynamic. And she kept looking to her parents for approval. As a child, I could have never, ever seen that, right? And I could have never had empathy even. I was only thinking about my own feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Through my own lens. So in the morning, I mean, I never slept, but I called them and I was hysterical. I was like, you did your best and I love Mm -hmm. you. And I'm so appreciative for the love, simply. I just, it was enough that I felt loved and that I loved them. And I was able to let go of all the stuff I felt they didn't get enough of, or I should have gotten more of, right? So I think that, I mean, this is a long way to answer your question, but oh, I think it's, it's an important one, really, that um, you, again, have the amazing responsibility to direct your life and to make choice, and you have desire. So just go after it. God, there's so much amazing things that you said there that I want to touch on. So first of all, the video thing is so powerful, and you're right. Um, so my parents were divorced growing up, and I, at the time, I was really the only person in my classroom, my school, that had divorced parents. And so I definitely felt like, you know, I was like the odd one out. And I watched back some videos, and it was when my parents had been divorced. It was a Christmas, and my dad would come over because my mum and my parents always want us to still feel united. So my dad came over on Christmas. My mum buys us a Christmas present from both of them even though they're divorced at this point from both of them because she knew that my dad was so busy and she didn't want us kids to not feel loved from my dad even though he loved us but you know kids kind of equate love sometimes with with gifts so she gives us a gift from both of us and my mom's video camera uh, recording and I open up the present and I'm like oh my god thanks dad and I go up to my dad and I give my dad a kiss and I don't even thank my mom and I saw that video and I literally immediately, I called you up and I'm like, oh my God, mom, I'm so sorry. I can't believe like how much you did for us as kids. But if you were to ask me about being grown up in a divorced family, the first thing I'd say is, yeah, I was probably, I was the only one of my friends that had divorced parents. I wouldn't say like, oh, oh my God, my mom and my dad did an amazing job keeping us together. And can you believe that? Right? Like I didn't even think of my mom. So everything becomes in hindsight. So I love that. And even what you're saying now is like, look, as an adult, we all have, a choice is how I like to think of it as well. It's like we all have a choice into how what we were taught or what we saw, how and when we use it now as adults. And we have to own that power. And um, also, as you were talking, there was one thing that came to mind that I think of. Think anyone watching right now, think right now. I'm going to ask you a question. I want everyone to hold it in their minds. What's the thing that one thing you failed at? Right? You, you may have it in your mind right now. What is that one thing? Okay, now imagine why did you fail it probably the first time you tried right let's just assume most things that i try for the first time i fail at think about being a parent no one's got experience no one you don't be a parent for a year or two before you actually become a parent so you parents don't know what they're doing like I, and I don't even have kids but I've thought about this a lot I'm like on day one I don't freaking know what I'm doing I may have changed diapers but actually bringing up a child no one has experience and then even if you've had three four five kids let's face it you don't know the the result until they're older it's kind of like the vaccine right where people are giving vaccines to people it's like I'm personally, I love the idea on how quickly we're trying to get a vaccine, but I'm still very worried about what that long-term thing looks like because the truth is we won't know. We won't know for five years, for 10 years. So think about your parents right now. They have no idea what they were doing when they were bringing you up. They'd never had an ex- um, a test subject. And so you were maybe one, the number one, number two, number three test. Um, and now they're only seeing the results now that we're older. So I like to kind of just give my parents slack, right? It's like, do you know who they were as humans? Do you think that they tried their best? Yes. Even if their lessons were horrific, let's not just blame. Let's go, okay, they did their best. Now how, as an adult, can I change it and make a difference? A thousand percent. I want to add that, you know, I have four kids and I can tell you the way I parent the fourth one, even the third one, very different than the first two. And it's not like, you know, we always make jokes and I hope it didn't damage you too much. <laughs> my oldest. But, you know, and, and I, I actually have a chapter on it in my relationship book um, because I love Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Outliers. And in it, he talks about to be great at anything takes practice, right? And he took, you know, he did studies again. And I love all of the science to it. He took people, for instance, who were musicians and he wanted to see how much did innate talent have to do with success, or how much practice had to do with the success. So he looked at violin players and what differentiated between who became 
let's say it was just a hobby or who became a music teacher or who became like the ah. Beatles, right? And he watched all of this. And what it came down to with his research was that it came down to practice. And to be great at anything takes 10 hours of practice, okay? 10,000 hours. 10, 10, oh, hours. 10, 10,000 hours of practice, which is 10 years. So I put it to relationships. Like I know when I got married and we had our first fight, I was like, hmm, it's not my fault. I'm good. And then I realized that you suck at this because you've never, you've been married for a day or you've been married for a week. Like, <laughs> yeah. What makes you think you've mastered this, right? And I think that people don't necessarily put in all of the practice that they need to become great at something. We just assume we'll figure it out, you know. Um, but yeah, to your point, a thousand percent. I think that people are doing the best that they can. And everybody is in the middle of a process. Even our parents, we're all in the middle right. of a process throughout our lives right but we assume that somehow they've arrived because they brought us into the world no they're still in the middle of a process dude that's so on point like a hundred percent because when i think of myself so my parents are you know in their 70s it's like i don't want to be done when i'm 70 like to think that i got all this um stuff figured out is actually fooling myself so don't put the pressure i love that like that our parents are still figuring it out Bam, that's a big mic drop right there, girl. Um, all right, so I think we've got some time for another question. Um, I really do want to talk about your book, though. Um, I haven't had the chance to read it, but um, it is called Rethink Love. So three steps to being the one, attracting the one, and becoming the one. Becoming. Um, everybody reads that wrong. Everybody. It's becoming one. Oh, becoming one. Which ah. I think is totally different. Exactly. But it's your mind. Everybody's mind just goes there automatically because everybody wants to find the one. Yeah, that's so true. Oh my God, I love that you just called me on that. Um, so when is the book out? And um, yeah, let's make sure we definitely talk about that. Is the book already out? The book is out. It's also on audio. Um, and do you it's read available. it yourself? I do. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that was painful though. I did it in three days because I, I flew into LA. I locked myself in that little box. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's my story and um, my, my passion. So um, yeah, so you can get it on Amazon. You can also go to my website, rethinklife.today and get it. Um, and, and I have a webinar tomorrow night as well. And you get the book for free. It's pay as you can. But if you pay a certain amount, you get the book included. That's cool. I'm so going to be downloading the Audible. Um, a, I just love Audible. Um, and it's kind of like plugging into the matrix. Because if you do it, you know, at like 1.5 or 2x, it's like, just like powered up um and then i also love it when it's the person actually reading it like that makes such a difference um, and so, so yeah. definitely going to check that out all right um um all right guys in fact women of impact who's watching can you put down the details of her book in the comments people are asking for the book again so let's make sure that we mention the book in the comments below and i'm going to choose one more question let's see what we got um Oh, we've got some great questions here. This is interesting. How to actively speak perspective? So perspective is an interesting thing um, because we are the sum of all of our experiences that we have in life. And they shape how we view things. And to the last question we just had, right? How we were raised, the things that happened to us, how we experienced trauma is then how we are able to derive purpose and meaning from things that then happen in our adult life. Perspective is when you are able to from experiences that you have. Can you hear me? Did you lose me for a second? Yeah, sorry. It, yeah, it just paused for a second. Sorry, can you go back? I just missed the first thing you said. Yes. So to be able to, because what is perspective? You want to be able to, to get to a higher place to kind of look over your life and be able to see it from a different point of view, right? And it's very hard to do, again, when you bring your past trauma, your past experiences that inform your future choices. The first thing you have to realize is that you each, me, you, all of us are more powerful than we give ourselves credit. Our ability to be able to affect change in our lives and other lives is unbelievable. And we tap into very little, a little amount of that energy. So if you're able to look at the things that happen and not bring in the victim consciousness or not bring in, I know this happens to me because I deserve it or, you know, 
all of that nonsense self-talk that we often have, then you're able to see things for what they are. You know, if somebody has an exchange with me and um, it wasn't a great conversation, I have, I have choices, right? I can either feel attacked or I can feel down on myself or I can believe them or I can stop and say, okay, what is it that this person might be feeling that they need to say X, Y, and Z? So it really just allows you to, when you choose to see something else, right? When you choose to give benefit of the doubt, when you choose to see that there might be another option that I don't have access to right away, instead of being super hyper-focused, looking like at a grain of sand on a beach when you want to take the whole beach into account, you're able to then just take a step back, remove the emotions, and just look at things for what they are. Yeah, I love that you said remove the victimness. That's so true because I think it's just embedded in all of us that like we can't, you know, naturally we go to that. Um, and there's one story that I actually would love to share on how just shifting my perspective changed um a situation that I had deemed as traumatizing to actually be one of the most beautiful lessons that I could have learned. So um, my husband went to my dad's on Greek Orthodox, very traditional. Um, I want to get married in a Greek church. I believe that, you know, the guy should speak to the father first. So Tom went to my dad and said, hey, you know, I'd love to um, propose to your daughter. Can I get your blessing? And my dad said, no. Um, <laughs> was a little traumatizing for him, but he was basically no. And Tom, they had a long discussion. And at the end, Tom said, look, I very much respect you, but I just want to let you know that I still plan to ask your daughter to, uh, you know, to marry me. So Tom proposes to me. He then tells me after he proposed, after I say yes, like, he's like, look, I, I know this is going to break your heart, but your dad wasn't keen on us getting married. And so I got very upset for the next two or three weeks. Me and my dad kept getting into arguments. I actually have a letter that I wrote to Tom that I plan to read one day in public. But like I wrote a letter to Tom saying I just want to elope because my dad not believing in us is really upsetting me. And like I really had trauma towards my dad over this. Um, now, cut to 19 years later, Tom and I are still married and we've been together for an amazing time. And I reflect back at what my dad was looking at. Now I look at the situation and say, okay, change my perspective. My dad comes from a tiny, tiny village in the mountains of Cyprus. He barely had a penny to his name. So his whole life, he saw his mum didn't have an education. She didn't even go to high school because they couldn't afford it. So he saw only men get educations. He saw women stay at home. And so he saw relationships between men and women is the man goes out and, um, and works and the woman stays home and supports. And if you don't have the same frame of mind on religion, if you don't have the same frame of mind on everything else, then the marriage cannot work. So my dad looks at the situation. And so he's like, well, you don't, you're not similar. You come from different worlds. Um, I don't know him, so I don't trust he's gonna provide for you. But my dad doesn't think of me being my own provider. He thinks of the husband being the provider. So he out of fear and out of utter love for his daughter, he turns around to Tom and says, no. Now, at the time, I was very upset. But now the perspective that I look at is like, my dad just loved me. My dad just cared so much for me that he was willing to potentially break my heart, right? And say no to this guy because he was so worried about my upbringing and my well-being. He was so worried that this man that he saw before him couldn't provide for his daughter, that he saw this man that he didn't know, you're, you're not Greek Orthodox. You have no idea about, you know, how to bring up a child in a Greek Orthodox religion. So all of these fears came out as a no. You know, I first of all, I love your story and thank you for sharing that. And it's so powerful once you can see the bigger picture. I think what gets in our way very often, it, it, the, I mean, the best way to get perspective is to ask questions, right? To be curious. If you had asked your father, what is it that, that once you recognize the fear, what is it you're afraid of, right? I think very often people are, don't want to have that conversation mm -hmm. because they are not prepared to hear the answers. Very often, we actually, if we're honest with ourselves, we want to keep our perspective. We don't want to be wrong, right? We want to feel justified in what we believe. And so it's, it's me against you. Even if that doesn't feel good, we, we feel more comfortable in that space. So know this. You can ask people their perspective. You can ask many questions. It doesn't mean, though, that you have to then accept it as truth. Mm -hmm. You just want to be, and I, I think that the most freeing thing that I started doing 
was really approach my life like a scientist, somebody who's just curious, both internally and externally. If there's things that people do that I don't understand, I'm not afraid anymore to ask, you know, this is what it feels like. I could be wrong, but what's going on? Let's talk about it because I'm not afraid to hear anything that they have to say about me or a situation because I'm comfortable enough with who I am at this point in my life. I was about to ask, have you always been like that? And how would you have handled it before? Um, and has that change been because you've done the internal work on yourself? Yes, I did. You know, I had an eating disorder at 17. And so I think for me, again, I see blessings in even the hardest things. I'm so happy that happened because it was either I slowly starved myself to death or I learned to love myself and I had to figure out how to do that. So in the first eight chapters of Rethink Love, I write about exactly how to do that for everybody because I think it is so, it's a necessary fundamental first step to loving and it's the foundation of every relationship you will ever have, right? It starts with you. It's the longest relationship you'll ever have. It's the last relationship you'll ever have. So imagine feeling uncomfortable in your skin all the time is really just not a way to live. So once I got to that place through really hard work, yeah, all of my interactions changed because it was no longer about me saying, you know, I've got to hold on to what I believe or people are going to take it away from me. You know, your beliefs are only at risk when you don't know what they are because then anybody can influence you over anything. And right. that never feels good, right? I didn't want to and do and when yeah. you attach your ego and self-esteem to your beliefs. Yes. Yes. You're, you're, um, you're, you're just feeling at any time you can be attacked yeah. for what you right. say, for what you do, for what you believe versus give me information. You know, I also talk about the difference between feedback and validation. A lot of people are looking oh. for validation in their life, right? So validation is help make me better, right? help make me better. Feedback is give me information so I can improve, right? Mm. Completely different. One is relying on somebody to basically save them, to take care of them, to make them feel good about themselves. Feedback is just information you get. And, and the only way that you'll be able to choose one or the other, again, is if you do that self-work. Yeah, God. And it's so fragile if you're relying on someone else to give you the confidence or, you know, to, um, to face the fear because if if you're really relying on someone else then it all depends on their emotions and how they're feeling in that moment um versus your own it will never last also you know right. let's say that somebody feels really insecure and they never felt beautiful and then they meet somebody that says oh you're, you're gorgeous you're the light of my life and then let's say he doesn't love you anymore and he doesn't think that anymore so now guess what you're going to start feeling bad about yourself again because it was never something that you created for yourself Right, exactly. Yeah. It's the um have you read the book um Anti Fragile? God, I can't remember who wrote it. Um, but basically that is like I think that becoming anti fragile allows you to keep growing because let's say someone throws negativity at you. If you can perceive that negativity and go, Okay, instead of getting emotional over it, is there truth to it? Because if you're able to open yourself up to it and there might be some truth, now that negativity just made you more powerful and stronger for it. But also if you're able to use that as your mindset, you can go, okay, there's actually no truth to it. Okay, then that person is just throwing hate because of an emotion they're going through. And then I can actually distance myself from the negative emotion penetrating my own emotion. A thousand percent. I think people often don't want to participate in that though because they already feel bad enough about themselves yeah. and any more negative feedback that they're going to get from somebody external will just throw them over the edge. And I understand that on a human level. That's why this work of self-love is so important for all the people listening who want to find somebody and, and, you know, not be lonely. Of course, we're, we're meant to be in, in a relationship. We're meant to have that experience, that touch, that company, but you will never, you will never find that outside if you don't first cultivate that within yourself. And sometimes people get lucky and they meet and they're able to do that work at the same time. It's far harder to do that. Um, but this fundamental step cannot be missed at any yeah. stage of your life. Yeah, I completely agree. And it all goes to, I think, also identity, right? Do you identify yourself as being fragile? Or, um, you know, for me, I kind of stole this from my husband, but I used to absolutely hate 
any type of criticism or negativity. The second it came up, I would feel badly about myself. And so, you know, it would then penetrate everything in my life. And then realizing just how um, uh, fragile that can be because you're relying on other people. But if you're able to switch your mindset and give your identity as the learner, right? Like literally just say, instead of this, I'm now the learner. So now imagine someone comes to you and throws hate at you or gives you a criticism. You can go, okay, my identity is the learner. All right. So maybe there's actually something I can learn here. And so it removes the immediate like auto um, reaction of getting in defense mode or feeling offended, which I used to do all the freaking time. Well, like, newsflash, you're human. I think we all do that to some <laughs> level, but we can certainly let, make it less and less until it, we don't really react to it at all, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Oh, girl, I literally could speak to you forever. Thank I you know. so much for coming on this live. Guys, we will be actually posting this as a podcast. So if you found it useful, if you want to go back, if you want to re-listen, um, go to Women of Impact on podcast. We will be releasing it. And then also we will, in case you haven't seen Monica's episode on Women of Impact, you've got to go check out women, um, her on Women of Impact. It was freaking amazing. And then, girl, if you can also let us know again where we can find your book. Um, and then we will also put it in the comments below for people to get it. Great. You can find it on Amazon and at rethinklife.today. Rethink life. Awesome, girl. Any parting <laughs> words for anyone? Uh, yeah, this is today's awesome and make it happen. Whatever it is that you are even curious about, that you have a small desire to pursue, just as we finish this, go and take your first step towards making that um, manifestation. I love that. Girl, thank you so much. Miss you. Hopefully I'll miss see you too. soon. I know. Um, Thank you. Let's hang, girl. Take care, I sweetie. Love that. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.